The following is a hoop ball presentation. Man, if that was game one, I am excited for what this season has to bring. Of course, we didn't start with a win, but that's all right. There's a lot of things to take away, both good and bad, from game one of the Lakers season. Welcome back to the Hoop Ball Lakers podcast. As always, I am your main man, Ethan Noroff, and I am stoked to be here with you. Of course, we'd rather start the season 1-0 than 0-1, but let's contextualize the loss a little bit, right? The Lakers obviously didn't play their best brand of basketball. They lost to a Clippers team that everybody seems to call the title favorites, right? There are positives to take away out of this win. Danny Green has Hello. Hi. How you doing? But there are some negatives as well. So we want to review game one and we want to take a look at things to examine for game two and beyond. But before we get started, we have to introduce our title sponsor, Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee. This podcast, like all our shows, is brought to you by them. Check out their website at HawaiianIsles.com or on Amazon by searching for Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee or on Twitter. You can follow them at H-I Kona Coffee. That's at H-I-K-O-N-A and then coffee. Whatever your favorite coffee was before, I promise you this will replace it. It's the good stuff and it's guts. It's what's got me feeling so caffeinated and ready to rock with y'all coming off of a loss in game one. Look, I'm not going to lie to you guys. It it was tough to watch that second half. It it was tough to watch because the Lakers offense stagnated. We saw a lot of standing around, just dumping the ball to Anthony Davis in the post, hoping he was going to do something. I wasn't loving Frank Vogel's rotations throughout that game. There are a lot of things we have to examine, but the reality is a 40 point second quarter is really what cost the Lakers that game. Frank Vogel and this Lakers team talks about clinging to a defensive identity, and that will dictate the ceiling of this group. I could not agree more, but when you give up 40 points in a quarter, it's not a good look for anyone involved. They got outscored 40 to 29 in the second quarter. That's an 11-point margin, and when you lose a game by 10 points exactly, you know where that loss is coming from. If we look up and down this Lakers roster and we examine the box score, I think that's the first stop for us today is deconstructing the box score from game one and trying to figure out what went right and what went wrong. When you look at this box score, we kind of knew that this was going to be the starting lineup, right? We knew Anthony Davis and LeBron James would both be in there. We knew Danny Green would be in there. And all training camp, we heard about Avery Bradley starting at the quote-unquote point guard spot and JaVale McGee keeping his spot inside. So that was the five-man lineup that we saw rolled out. It looked good for the first quarter. The Lakers got off to a hot start. Things were aligning, but then things started to stagnate, and Frank Vogel got really wacky with some rotations. You know, I don't love that LeBron James and Anthony Davis both played at least 36 minutes, but it is game one. So that's not the biggest takeaway for me. The biggest takeaway for those two for me is, yes, there were moments where they look good, but a combined 15 of 40 from the field, one of seven from distance and 12 of 18 from the free throw line simply is not going to get it done for this Lakers team. This is a top heavy roster. And when the two megastars combine for 43 points on 40 shots, it is not a recipe for success. Anthony Davis very uncharacteristically left five free points at the free throw line. And although He was plus three during his time on the floor. LeBron was a minus eight. So that is something to watch as we move forward. Danny Green was actually the leading scorer in this game for the Lakers. I don't know how many more times we're going to be able to say that this season, but I think what we have to look at is even when Kyle Kuzma comes back to this Lakers team and they have that third guy, or so we think, there is going to have to be someone who consistently steps up next to Anthony Davis and LeBron James that is to say, hey, I'm here to help, and it doesn't have to be the same guy every night. Danny Green might be that guy one night. Avery Bradley might be that guy one night. Kyle Kuzma might be that guy one night, probably most nights, at least the Lakers have to hope, right? once he gets back on the floor, but he's facing an uncertain timetable. And the updates that we've got on Kuzma, frankly, have been incredibly vague, and I think purposefully so. I don't even think the Lakers know when he's going to be back. So to offer up a timetable to the public just so he can't meet it doesn't really do a lot of benefit for this group, especially right now. 
I have to say the atmosphere in Staples Center was electric. Watching this game on television, there was a point in the third quarter when Danny Green was raining down threes where I just could not even hear the announcers. They just weren't even speaking because it was so loud in Staples Center for game one of the regular season. This wasn't a playoff game. This wasn't end of season positioning. This was game one, Kawhi versus LeBron, Paul George on the sidelines for the Clippers, but a deep and talented Clippers team and the battle for LA is real. You know, that's not my favorite phrase, but man, there is something there this year. There is no question about it. These two teams are supposed to be two of the best the NBA has to offer, and it was an exciting way to start the season despite the loss. So as we continue to go through the box score, Danny Green with his 28 points, obviously he caught fire from behind the three-point line in the third quarter, seven of nine from distance in the game, 10 of 14 overall, 28 points from Mr. Green. That's why they paid him $15 $15 million a year in order to be on this roster. He is a great fit alongside Anthony Davis and LeBron James, but the Lakers are simply going to need more. And when I look up and down this box score, I notice two big things. One is Alex Caruso. Maybe he wasn't able to play. Maybe that pelvic injury he had was still bothering him, but I thought it was interesting that he was the only point guard not to get into the mix, especially with Rajon Rondo sidelined due to the calf injury. When Rondo is ready to play, you would have to imagine that Frank Vogel's rotations will change once again. But Contavious Caldwell-Pope, Quinn Cook, Troy Daniels, and Jared Dudley cannot combine for a whopping 16 points. That cannot happen. Contavious Caldwell-Pope played 27 and a half minutes in this game. Three rebounds, three assists, no steals, no blocks, five fouls, no points. That cannot happen. KCP has to be a contributor off this bench in the second unit in order for the Lakers to lengthen their rotation out. It has to work. Quinn Cook is an interesting guy, can be a little bit of instant offense off the bench. Seven shots, four points is the wrong balance. Troy Daniels played 16 minutes in this game, which was very surprising to me. But again, six shots for six points ain't going to cut it. And Jared Dudley, yes, he hit both of his shots. Yes, both were threes. But when you're minus 20 in 13 and a half minutes, something has gone very, very wrong. So I'm very curious to see how the Lakers are going to handle this bench. Because even Dwight Howard, although he had some moments where he was effective at the rim, defending the rim, 3.6 boards, 19 minutes, not exactly a difference maker off the bench. Dwight Howard played 19 minutes. JaVale McGee played 17 and a half. So that's 36 and a half at the center position from those two. And Anthony Davis sort of filled in the rest of it, right, with a few minutes at center. And the Lakers, there was there were several points in this game where you looked up and down at who was out there and you said, I never want to see these five guys out there at the same time together. You cannot have Quinn Cook, Jared Dudley, Contavious Caldwell Pope all on the court together. There is not enough offense out there, especially if they're flanked by Dwight Howard inside. So Vogel is still searching and understandably so. Look, like we said, it's game one one and he does not have a fully healthy roster obviously kuzma's been out for a while but i think rajon rondo's absence really wasn't something the lakers had planned for and that might have been a little bit of a curveball for vogel to deal with so when we deconstruct this box score what we really look at is guys who are in the positive in terms of plus minus we said anthony davis was plus three javel was even so he was not positive or negative danny green was plus seven But that is it, my friends. Everybody else, including LeBron James, was a negative in this game. And if I want to talk about LeBron for just one second, yes, the line looks decent, except for the shooting. Obviously, 7 of 19, 18 points, 9 boards, 8 assists, a near triple-double, a steal, a block, 5 turnovers. That's all gravy. The turnovers need to come down. But I'm a little concerned about LeBron. I'm hopeful that he was purposefully taking a step back in order for this Lakers team to take a step forward. So if you follow LeBron for any extended stretch of his career, you know that he has this habit of surveying the floor before he makes his dominance known. He wants to give guys the other opportunities, and he has been incredibly vocal about the Lakers' need to play through Anthony Davis. So I'm hoping this was just a game one thing because they were really forcing it to AD, and LeBron did not dominate in his more traditional ways. But obviously at this point in LeBron's career, we have to also acknowledge the other side of that coin and say there is a concern there. The Clippers have a lot of good perimeter defenders. Patrick Beverly, of course, being near the top of that list. Kawhi being at the top of that list. But guys like Patrick Patterson, Jamichael Green, even Mo Harkless, those are all guys who can really bother you. I mean, you look up and down at this Clippers roster and there's a lot of guys who put a lot of ball pressure on. And really with this box score, as much as we are here to talk about the Lakers, 
The biggest difference in literally looking at the screen in front of me is 60 bench points from the Clippers. They got 17 from Montrez Harrell, 21 from Sweet Lou for a whopping 38 combined. Mo Harkless kicked in 10. That brings it to 48. And Jamichael Green with the final 12. That brings it to an even 60. So almost half of the Clippers, 112 points, came from the bench unit. Kawhi had his usual night, 30 points on an efficient shooting line, but an uncharacteristic six turnovers. So all things considered, the Lakers did a pretty good job on Kawhi Leonard. But that bench, that was the clear difference in between these two teams on game one. That's what the Lakers couldn't contend with, and that's what ultimately sent them home with a loss. And look, here are some issues for the Lakers. A very stagnant offense, right? The five-man combos, the point guard rotations. And when we look at those three things specifically, part of what I wonder about is who is responsible for this offense's evolving. And what I mean by that specifically is when you sit here and you look at the Lakers, you know that Frank Vogel's identity as a head coach has always been wrapped up in defense. Who will be responsible for moving this team forward offensively? As much as LeBron James will handle the ball and assume some of those traditional point guard responsibilities, I do not think playing him at point guard for the duration of the game is the best way to go at this point in his career. Maybe Rajon Rondo surprises a lot of us and it becomes an actual positive contributor for this team. Obviously, the club values what he brings to the table. LeBron is a huge advocate. Anthony Davis is a huge advocate. Frank Vogel likes veterans. I would have to imagine a guy like Troy Daniels probably gets bumped from the rotation with Rajon Rondo available. But Quinn Cook, Alex Caruso, those are two guys who can contribute. All the point guards on this roster do different things, whether it's Bradley, whether it's Caruso, whether it's Rondo or whether it's Cook. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that balance shakes out, but there's no question that LeBron and AD are going to have to be more efficient for this Lakers team to win. Now, we've started off by being really negative. I want to bring out some positives in this game, okay? And before we do that, I want to introduce you to a brand new sponsor at Hoop Ball for the pre- for the pod. You already know it's mybookie.ag. That's M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E.ag. You got to check it out. Sign up using the code TODAY, T-O-D-A-Y, and my bookie will match your first deposit up to $1,000. You heard it right, one zero 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 one thousand dollar $1,000 match. I don't know where else you're getting that. And in fact, no matter where you work and what you do, I know your retirement policy isn't that good. So up to $1,000 match, that's mybookie.ag. We got to rep them because they're going to be a big part of the hoop ball family. We look forward to having them aboard. All right, so let's get more positive, right? I just told you that that site, mybookie.ag, will not only match your money, but they'll match it up to $1,000. Let's bring that positivity back over to the Lakers. Hey, Anthony Davis is a Laker. And at the same time, LeBron James is a Laker. And at the same time, the Lakers are still going to be a very good team. Let's not hyper analyze game one as a project for what's going to be coming in the future, right? It's possible that, yes, this Lakers team did not play at their maximum potential. It's also possible that, yes, this Lakers team will miss Kyle Kuzma while he's sidelined. And, yes, it's also possible that LeBron James and Anthony Davis did not play well. And, yes, it's also possible that the Lakers lost to a title favorite in the Los Angeles Clippers and for most of the game played them pretty tightly. None of those things are mutually exclusive. They can all occur at the same time. This is a Clippers team that nearly everybody is picking to win the title. And I realize that Paul George wasn't on the court, but the Lakers played a road game. Yes, it's in Los Angeles. Yes, it's in the Staples Center. I understand, but it's a different dynamic. Even though there were a lot of Lakers fans in the building, it's a different dynamic than a home opener. And the reality is the Lakers still played a tightly contested contest. And this roster is brand new. All of these guys, except for the small handful who were here last year, are all new to each other. That includes LeBron and AD. And that's a huge factor because this Clippers roster up and down, for the most part, has a lot of continuity. In fact, three of the five starters in game one 
were starters last season in Patrick Beverly, Landry Shamit, and Avica Zubats, right? The only new additions were Kawhi Leonard, who can adjust to just about anywhere, I would like to think, and Patrick Patterson, who was a surprise starter, and that spot will be vacated by Paul George. But with Trez and Lou and the chemistry they have off the bench and Mo Harkless and Jamichael Green filling in the gaps, Green, Harrell, and Williams were all on this Clippers team last year. So the other thing the Clippers have over the Lakers right now is a better sense of continuity. Okay, but there are some positives to take out of this as well. It it looks like Dwight Howard is going to be very willing to accept any role that's given to him. He has been great through training camp. He has said all the right things. He has done the right things. It's been nothing but gravy in terms of the role that he's accepting. However, I am curious to see how effective he will be as the season progresses. And I'm curious to see if there is a point where Dwight Howard enters the starting lineup. Because when Rajon Rondo is back on the floor, I do feel that JaVale McGee might actually be a better fit as a rim runner coming off the bench with Rondo in shorter spurts. And Dwight Howard is a bigger frame than JaVale McGee, a little bit better equipped to handle some of those bigger bodies that the Lakers are going to face. Evita Zubac isn't a dominant center in terms of his size and his strength. So JaVale definitely started game one, and I'm sure will continue to start game two and beyond. But don't be surprised if Dwight finds his way into the starting lineup as the Lakers continue to tinker with these machinations and decide what works and what doesn't. I also wouldn't be surprised if KCP's role shrinks as the season progresses in terms of the minutes he's allotted. 27 and a half minutes feels like a lot of time for KCP. I would like to see him more in that 20 to 25 minute range with a defined role. But the reality is the Lakers are going to be asking a lot of that starting lineup. Danny Green, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, those guys are going to have to carry a heavy load. And once Kyle Kuzma comes back, that will certainly help. But the reality is the Lakers are still going to need consistent contributions from the bench. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot have more than 20 shots taken off the bench and score a combined a combined 19 points. KCP, three shots. Dwight Howard, three shots. Quinn Cook, seven shots. That's 13. Daniels with six. That's 19. Dudley with two. It's 21 shots off the bench. Combined, they scored 19 points. 19 points on 21 shots off the bench. 43 points on 40 shots from Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Anthony And Avery Bradley with eight points on seven shots. It's not a good ratio, okay? It's not going to work. The Lakers can't shoot sub 44% from the field and expect to win. But on the other side of that, here's how the Lakers win this game. If LeBron James and Anthony Davis combine to make four more shots between them, so let's say Anthony Davis goes 10 of 21 and LeBron goes 9 of 19, I think that's a realistic ask for both of those guys, right? They each make two more shots, two more two-point shots. That's eight points right there. Lakers lost by 10. Anthony Davis makes three of the five free throws that he missed. It's a Lakers win. Okay, that's how fast things can change in the NBA. So don't get too discouraged. If you're sitting there in your Lakers footy pajamas and you're ready to throw the remote at the TV after one game of the regular season, I'm here to tell you stop, wait, collaborate, and listen. Okay, we're all going to be fine. It's going to be okay. And the reality is for this Lakers group, this is the first season in a while where there are legitimate expectations. Right? We like to pretend last year that there were legit expectations and, oh my God, LeBron could take these kids and turn them into a title contender because that's the power of LeBron. Well, I think that was a false assumption. I feel like that we overextended ourselves in that belief because if you look at the Pelicans without Zion Williamson, they are last year's Lakers without LeBron James. And do they play hard? Yes. Do they play correctly? Not always. Okay. This team can't be in the player development business anymore. This is not what the Lakers are. And you can tell that that's not in their core. This is what they did in reconstructing the roster. This is not an exercise in player development. This is an exercise in readiness to win. The biggest thing for me is the Lakers simply have to be more efficient. They have to be more controlled. They have to be more purposeful. I love seeing 13 of 33 from the three-point line for 39.4%. That's fantastic. 15 of 21 from the free throw line isn't horrible, but it's barely over 70% at 71.4. And the turnovers. The turnovers have to be cut down. LeBron James cannot have five turnovers. Anthony Davis can have a few. That's okay. But eight between them is too many. And actually, Lakers as a team only had 14 turnovers. It was the same number as the Clippers. Right? So that's a big improvement from the preseason. The Lakers won the first quarter and the third quarter by a combined 11 points. 
The problem is they got outscored in the second quarter by 11 points, and then they went cold in the fourth. That's what happened. That's how the Lakers lost this game. It wasn't Clipper dominance. It wasn't Lakers sagging. It was Lakers sagging at a certain point, right? We know what this Lakers team needs to be successful. Anthony Davis and LeBron James need to be on. If they score 50 points between the two of those guys, which again is a very realistic ask, right? The Lakers are going to be in good shape. It's going to be rare that LeBron James takes more shots than points scored. It's going to be rare that LeBron James gets to the foul line four times in a game. Four times in the entire game for LeBron. You know who took more free throws than LeBron James? Montrez Harrell. Now, granted, he was only three of eight, but he took more free throws than LeBron James. Okay, that's not a good thing. You could tell me that alone, and I could tell you the Lakers would have lost that game. Bottom line, I think the biggest question that I have is how Rajon Rondo's return will impact the Lakers' rotation at the point guard position. Because it's not just going to be about LeBron James. It's going to be about those other guys we talked about. It's going to be about Quinn Cook. Is there still room for him? Alex Caruso, when he's ready to play, if he's not healthy right now, when he is ready to play, does he get a look? Because this team could use what he brings to the table. And Avery Bradley, how effective can he be, right? Avery Bradley was a minus one in his 24 minutes, so he definitely wasn't the problem. But eight points, three boards, no assists, and a couple of threes. He didn't play lockdown defense by any stretch in terms of on-ball defense on the perimeter. So is Avery Bradley a guy who might see his minutes reduced over time? The Lakers paid Avery Bradley to be a contributor. Frank Vogel seems to really like what he brings to the table. I'm not saying there's not a role for Avery Bradley on this team. I'm just not I'm just not here to tell you for a fact that Avery Bradley should be playing more than any of those other point guards I mentioned, Rondo, Caruso, or Cook. And I know Rondo is like this vitriol, this poison for a lot of Lakers fans. And we say, oh my God, why is Rondo on the floor? He's such a negative. I can't believe it. I'm willing to give him a chance. The reality is he's on the team. Okay, it's kind of like in fantasy sports, especially in fantasy basketball, right? That's what we're here to do after all. In fantasy basketball, we do this all the time. We say, oh, this player should play more. So he'll grow into his potential and he'll be given a bigger role. And I can't wait to draft him because he's going to be a sleeper on my team. And then we are invariably disappointed when that does not happen because the coaching staff is more invested in another player. The reality is we are not calling the shots. We can try to predict based on information. We can make strategical decisions based on available information. But when a team is invested in a player, you have to also recognize that and understand that things aren't going to change until they change. And Rajon Rondo, although he was brought back on a minimum deal, it's very clear that he has a role on this team. It is abundantly clear that Anthony Davis and LeBron James really want him on the court. And there's talk that his shot has improved. Great. We always hear that in the preseason, whether it's Rondo or anyone else. And to be fair, Rondo has become a better shooter as his career has gotten, has progressed and he's gotten later into his career. Is he ever going to be a knockdown spot up three point shooter? Absolutely not. But can he be a capable contributor on this Lakers team? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not willing to define the outcome before I see what it looks like. And that's the thing with expectations. We all go in expecting Lakers to be gelling right away, take off from the start. There is so much newness with this team. Remember, we sat here a few months ago and said DeMarcus Cousins was going to be the center, right? There's been a lot of adjustments leading up to this point. So I'm curious to see how the Lakers bounce back. Home opener is Friday night. Although it's in the same building, it's going to have a different feel. Partially because it's not against the Clippers and partially because it's going to be the Lakers home opener, but it's not against an easy group. This Utah jazz team, they're talented. When Mike Conley can shoot one of 16 from the floor and the jazz can win. Yeah. They got some guys who can really give you a challenge. The Lakers are going to have to slow down Donovan Mitchell. They're going to have to answer for Rudy Gobert inside. And they're going to have to be able to defend the perimeter. At the end of the day, this Lakers team, I totally agree with Frank Vogel, will need to be built on defense. But it's going to take time to get there. The Lakers have to come out of the first 10 games of the season at least 6-4. and four. They have to have a positive margin after the first 10 games of the season because it's only going to get more difficult from there. 
okay? But don't sit here and try to make snap decisions and judge this team based off of one game. It's one game. Focus on the positives a little bit more. An electric atmosphere. A team that includes LeBron and AD. Highlight plays. And for a lot of that game, the Lakers looked good even though they weren't playing up to the level of their potential and really anything close to it. So there are good things we can take away from this game. But 43 points on 40 shots from from LeBron James and Anthony Davis simply won't work. There is no way that's going to work for this Lakers team. If they scored 43 on 30 shots combined, that's a different story. But that's not the story that we got. So moving forward, this Lakers group needs to tighten up the rotations. Frank Vogel needs to decide who can actually contribute. Going 10 guys deep is not a benefit for this Lakers team. Not right now. Tighten it up. Learn who you can, tr- who you can trust, who you can rely on, and let's move forward. Danny Green will be a big part of this team. LeBron James and Anthony Davis are at the epicenter of this team. But the Lakers need more, especially while Kyle Kuzma is out. Because we know Kyle Kuzma can score the basketball, but he's going to be asked to do different things as well for this team. We've talked about that here. If I'm the Lakers, I have things that encourage me and I have things that concern me. That's like any first investment into any activity. But moving forward, losing to the Clippers is not the death knell that so many people want to call it. The Clippers beating the Lakers in game one doesn't mean they own Los Angeles. All of these snap decisions, we are living in a society right now where everybody wants to be up or down, left or right, white or black. It has to be a certain decision. You know what? It's one game. I feel like Stephen A. Smith. It's one game. Come on, guys. Everybody take a step back in order for us to take a step forward. The Lakers are back. Basketball is on. The NBA is here through June. We're in a good spot. But we have to make consistent progress. And that's my challenge to Frank Vogel. Learn who you can contri- who, who is going to contribute to this team. Learn who you can rely on to play their roles. And a lot of these guys need to understand they have a very defined role. The stagnant offense needs to change. There needs to be more movement ab- around LeBron James, but especially Anthony Davis. What I saw in game one, the standing and watching, was reminiscent of what we saw late in Kobe's career. Four guys watching one guy trying to do it all because nobody had the verve to say, hey, give me the ball or move without being prompted. This Lakers team will have to grow together, but also individually on their own. They will all be asked to do more than they might be accustomed to. But the Lakers have a target on their back they haven't had in a while. And that's in and of itself an adjustment process. Friday night against the Jazz, can't wait. Looking forward to Lakers getting their first win of the season. That's right. I'm calling it now. Lakers come out of Friday night's home opener at a smooth one-on-one, crisp as if they were a vegetable in the draw in your fridge. Shout out to Chick Hearn. I can't wait for the butter to be jiggling, or the jello to be jiggling, the butter getting hard, and the Lakers putting this one in the refrigerator. Until next time, I'm your main man, Ethan Noroff. You can follow me on Twitter at Ethan underscore Noroff, N-O-R-O-F. You can follow us on Twitter at Hoopball Lakers. And as always, subscribe to the Hoopball Lakers pod on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Leave the five-star review. Leave us a comment. We always appreciate feedback. And until next time, we out. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.